Welcome back to Man vs. Meeple. I'm Ryan, and today I'm bringing you a review of Speakeasy Blues from Daryl Andrews and Adrian Adamascu. This is the team that designed Sagrada. This is the next game from them. In Speakeasy Blues, each player takes on the role of a speakeasy trying to compete to be number one in the middle of Prohibition in New York City. The way you're going to prove yourself to be the best speakeasy is by having the best collection, attracting the most socialites, and having the most cops and gangsters on your payroll. Speakeasy Blues is a dice drafting, dice placement, tableau building game. So it is not the same as Sagrada, though it does use a dice placement aspect just like Sagrada did. But if you're expecting this to be kind of the same game because it's from the same designers, don't expect that. This is definitely a heavier game than Sagrada is. If you take a look in front of me, you'll see the board already set up. Now what you have in the middle are all of your dice placement spots, which are linked to the different actions. And you'll see a tableau already set in progress here. On the far side of the board, you will see the event cards. Every turn, there is a different event that flips over and affects everyone globally. Mixed in with these events are a few contests. There are three of them, so there will be three contests every game, and these will determine your in-game scoring. The board is seated with dice already placed in some of the dice placement spots. Now you'll notice that all these dice are a different color, which is important for the way the game is played, but when you start, the board is just seated kind of like this randomly. These dice are rolled and placed on the matching symbols. Once the game begins, each player will take a turn in clockwise order. If you look at this board, you'll notice, like I said, the, the different colors. Your job is to pick a matching set of colors and remove it from the board. What you're doing here is you're taking dice away so that maybe you can place dice in those spots because if a spot is full, like this here, you cannot place dice there. So on my turn, I will choose two matching colored dice. For example, remove these two green dice. I will roll them and then add them to the dice pool. Now, this dice pool does not change. So before you pull the dice, you know what your options might be, and then there's a chance for two more random symbols to come up. If you don't like the dice, you can pay a buck out of your personal supply and just reroll the entire dice pool. So there is some mitigation there. There are also some cards that you can build into your tableau that will allow you to mitigate those dice even further. So once you've rolled, you take up your pick of the dice to place. Now, just like when you were pulling dice, you have to pick a matching color. So for example, I can pick the pink, yellow, or green here, but I am limited to those actions. So you have to look on the board and decide which actions you want to take. So you'll take your dice, place them on the relevant spots, and then take those actions. Now there are seven actions you can take, including one in the middle that requires any die, so it can be kind of a wild. So the collection action allows you to take one of these purple collection cards. Now, these are going to score you victory points at the end of the game. Whenever you take a card, it is slotted into your personal tableau. Now you'll notice you only have four slots in your tableau. So as you draft more cards, you're going to actually ha have to stack them on top of each other. Only the cards on the top of your tableau matter. Those are the actions you can take. Those are the points you're going to score at the end of the game. So I just drafted this car, which at the end of the game scores me points for all of my cars, if it's at the top. So I can bury this, put another collection on top of it, I'm no longer scoring cars. However, if I get another car and put it on top, now I'm back to scoring cars again. So that is part of the strategy in drafting and placing those cards. Society is handled the same way. You draft one of these society figures. Now, these are all based on real historical figures from the time, which I think is a nice added touch. These cards also go to your tableau. Society members give you special um, augmented abilities where you can give them hooch um, in order to activate a special augmented ability. So this guy, whenever I take the crime action, he, he does the crime action a little bit better. And you're gonna see a bunch of society cards that do things like that. Some of them give you immediate abilities and sometimes they give you once per turn ongoing abilities you can use. So just like with the collection cards, you draft these, you put them in your tableau. Up here is simple, you either gain one or two hooch. Over here and the favor, you take favor with either the cops or one of the two criminal gangs. 
Now, these favorite tokens are important because at the end of the game, there is kind of a set collection aspect. Whoever has the most of each of these is gonna score 10 points. So you wanna have um, a lot. You wanna try to go all in with one particular faction. You'll notice that um, with the graphic design here, each one of these lines lines up to a color on the event card. That's how much money you're going to get when you take that favor action. It's nice because you can look ahead. Some of these factions are gonna be worth different amounts of money at different times. For the crime action here, you take the crime deck, you draw three cards, you look at them. Now you're gonna have, like I said, cops and gang members. Um, there are two different types of gangsters for the two different families. You're gonna take one of these cards and you're gonna put it face down on your tableau. Now, these cards all have abilities. Some of them, again, are instantaneous. Some of them are once per turn, but the fact is they're hidden. They don't activate until you decide to flip them over. Again, they have to be at the top of your stack. So if I take another crime card and stack it on top of it, I can't use that buried crime card anymore. So again, that is the main strategy of the game, is using this limited tableau and trying to maximize your actions, knowing when you don't need to use an ability anymore, or maybe flipping over a crime card that is a one-time ability and then covering it with something else because you can't use that ability again. Now one cool thing about these crime cards is that if I flip over a gangster to use their ability, if anyone at the table has a cop card in their tableau, they can flip it to expose that they have a police officer and cancel my gangster action. So that's another bit of strategy. You kind of want to look at the table and see who has crime cards on top of their tableau, face down, because if they do, there could be a cop hiding inside there. The jazz action, if you place down here, lets you take either one of these times two or wild tokens. Times two token can be cashed in and let you take a particular action twice. The wilds let you turn that in to change your die to any face and get $2 from the bank. So that's a quick and easy way to make some money. The last action in the middle is the soiree action. And this is where you're actually throwing a big party within your speakeasy. You look at your tableau of everyone that is currently in your speakeasy and you look at the symbols that are at the bottom corner of those cards. For every symbol, you get whatever it tells you to get. You're either getting a dollar or you're moving your reputation one up on the reputation track. Now this reputation track is gonna score you victory points at the end of the game, but there are plenty of actions on the board that lower your reputation. For example, taking a crime card or a jazz token will lower your reputation. So you have to balance that reputation, you have to balance your tableau, and you want to watch out for upcoming events and try to complete those, complete those contests. So there is a lot going on here. You don't wanna collect a bunch of cards, for example, and then accidentally bury your set collection card with a crime card, so the crime card's on top, scoring you no points. So you have to really think about what you're doing in this game, which I, I like that aspect of this a lot. I have to say, I like this game, um, as far as dice placement games go, it gives you a lot to think about when you're placing your dice. The fact that you have to pull a specific color roll and then place a specific color. I mean, it means that you're not given free reign to take whatever actions you want whenever you want to. You might really want a society action, but maybe that's coupled with like a hooch action and you don't really need the hooch, but you know, do you want to take the risk and, and re-roll all the dice and, and see what happens? So you have to really, really think about your dice placement. At the end of the game, you're gonna score for those sets of the different um, police officers and the two different families of gangs. You're gonna score one point for every collection card, no matter where it is. So all those purple cards, even if they're buried, every card is worth one point. However, if you do have any one of those set collection cards on top, it's gonna to score points for the value of every single card of that type, no matter where it is in your tableau. So even if it's buried, you're still gonna score points for it. You're also gonna score points for reputation, for any contests that you completed, for the money that you have left at the end of the game, and potentially for any hooch that you have left that you have not used at the end of the game. So there are a lot of ways to score. Scoring, especially with the, the way the tableau works where you only can score a set if it's the top card triggering that set collection point value, I think that's a lot to grasp for a new player that isn't really a board gamer. However, more experienced gamers are really gonna enjoy that because it's tricky, it's a puzzle with your tableau, trying to make sure that you have the right card on top when you need it. Don't accidentally bury an ability that you need the next turn and mess yourself up. The game is also fairly mean as far as the take that aspect. 
These crime cards have you stealing from people. You're stealing money. You're stealing hooch. You're stealing cards out of their tableau. You're, you can really mess with the players on the table. Now, you can mitigate that by going heavy on like the police, drawing those crime cards, hoping to get some police officers and cancel any crime action that's taken against you. Some players are going to really like to take that aspect. Some players aren't. But I think that the, the biggest stumbling block and really, in, in my opinion, the only real detriment to the game is the iconography. There are a ton of icons to understand. After you've played the game a few times, those icons make perfect sense. Like you can just read through them. You don't even have to really think about it. Everything works in a way that, that's very satisfying. All the cards kind of work like you expect them to. So it wasn't a huge hurdle, I'll admit, but th that's probably the only detractor from what I think is otherwise a very excellent puzzly dice placement game. I love that they have actual items in the set collection, famous movie theaters, horses, boats, and all the socialites are actual famous people from the era. A lot of the crime cards are famous people. Now, I don't know if they all are, but I, the amount of research they put into this game, I kind of assume they all are. I definitely recognize a few famous names, and if you're a fan of the time period, you're probably going to recognize some of these names as well. So if you think any of this sounds appealing to you, check it out. The game is um, released at Gen Con. It should be going to retail very soon from Artana. Like I said, this is the same team that did Sagrada. So if you liked Sagrada, Sagrada serves as a great entry-level game. This, I think, is kind of the step up from that. So if you think that might be something that's up your alley, definitely check out Speakeasy Blues. And as always, thanks for watching the channel. Please subscribe here on YouTube, like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Stay up to date on all of our new videos, and I will see you next time.